So, we've got a great morning for you. You've got, um, you got uh, two fantastic speakers and me. Uh, <laughs> um, you really, really do. Uh, a couple of, of um, things I, I want to uh, recognize and thank uh, Neomond uh, for providing breakfast for us. They are uh, partners with us in a lot of ways. Um, they are member benefit providers. Uh, you, you should have in your little stack, you should have a 10% off coupon for today. It is for today, so keep that in mind so you can go down and have lunch after that. It's phenomenal Mediterranean um, Lebanese food. Uh, and uh, But, so that's 10% off today with that coupon. If you are a member, you get 10% off uh, the food, the prepared food anytime you go there. So it's a great deal. And there's a lot of other member benefit providers. Um, you got that on your handout. Um, a lot of uh, other benefits to membership beyond education um, uh, classes and, and things like that. One of the big ones is free plants. We'll talk about that later when, when I get up here and talk about plants. Um, so I want to go ahead and get started because uh, I can never uh, uh, hear too much of, of Bryce Lane. Um, he was here giving a talk to professionals on this past Thursday, and I was taking notes um, uh, along with everybody else, and I know I will be today again. Bryce uh, is a, was a longtime lecturer with the Department of Horticultural Science, um, still does some teaching here at, at, in Horticultural Science. He's, he's part of our staff as instructor. <coughs> he's been a two-time uh, interim director of the Arboretum and a three-time three time. Emmy winner, Emmy Award winner for in the Garden with Bryce Lane, uh, which was a fantastic uh, show that ran for many years. So, without uh, without uh, going any further, because Bryce will Bryce will really be able to tell you what, what he's going on. But uh, anything you want to know about gardening, Bryce is going to be able to help you out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anything about gardening? anything? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to be the warm-up act for Ann Spafford and Mark Weather. Um, you are in for a real treat, because these two individuals um, have incredible enthusiasm for gardening and for plants, and uh, they have a unique and interesting talent to be able to communicate that. And so I'm, I'm thrilled that I get to get you guys a little bit loose and sweaty and then they'll come and 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 clarify everything I said um, so I need to ask a few questions uh, first of all raise your hand if you're one of the 84 who moved to Raleigh today <laughs> okay they're busy um, no how many of you have recently moved to Raleigh within the last year oh my god oh, wow. oh you are in for such a treat Talk about frustration. How many would consider themselves beginning gardeners? Oh, we are, you're in the right place. How many would consider themselves intermediate? Okay, and how many would consider themselves experienced? We have an eclectic group of gardeners, and that's a good thing. Let me tell well, I'll, I'll get, I'm getting excited because I wanna, I'm a gardener too. <laughs> no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mark Weathington mentioned this at another conference. In the Department of Horticultural Science at NC State, we have, a, we have many, many people who are professors of horticulture that are scientists in horticulture, and that does not equal gardener, okay? I am proud to say at NC State University in the Department of Horticultural Science, we have more faculty members who are gardeners than any other land-grant Department of Horticulture in the country, okay? That's it. I have not done the research to support that statement. <laughs> But I am 100% convinced that we do. And as a result, we're able to come and talk to people like yourselves and even to our own students in the classroom in a way that brings the experience that we have of gardening and the science that we know about gardening. All right? And so please understand, and many of you probably do, there's a science to gardening and then there's the experience of gardening. I remember a long time ago I told I was talking about putting plants in containers and all containers had to have drainage holes. Told a hundred students in a class. They had spring break, off they went. They came back. A young man came up, he said, I talked to my grandma who's been growing plants in containers for 60 years and I told her she needs to start putting plants <laughs> in containers with drainage holes because she doesn't. And she told me to tell you <laughs> 
tell that damn Yankee to go home. <laughs> so please understand, there's a right way to do it, then there's the way we do it. Some of you in here will defy the science. Some, a very small group. And so the more you can learn the science and apply it to the practice of gardening, the better off you'll be. So I'm excited about that. As gardeners, don't we love to talk about gardening? Okay, I read an article um, a couple of years ago said that the idea of gardening is actually more popular than gardening. <laughs> so this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about the power of plants. To me, that's my tagline. Plants, plants have power. I talk about, oh, how plants have power to transform our lives, okay, outside of gardening, how plants have the power to teach us so much, okay, and, and, and then I want to put this word sustainable in there because we hear it everywhere, and I want to make sure that as gardeners, maybe we understand what it means to be sustainable, all right, because there's a word that is just like organic. We could spend the rest of the day talking about the, what, what organic means, what sustainable means, and it really depends on a number of different things. I heard a businessman talk about sustainable lawn care, and he spent most of his time talking about how he keeps his business alive. That's sustainability in certain respects. The approach he takes to keeping his, his business alive. This morning I want to talk about a sustainable approach to home gardening. So I'd like to start out by proposing to you, it is my opinion that gardening is a craft. I liken gardening to a craft. I consider myself a craftsperson relative to gardening. All right? How many of you have crafts outside of gardening? Right? So, so if we think of gardening as a craft, when you learned that craft outside of gardening, what was the first thing you had to do to learn how to do it? Fail. Fail? <laughs> Even before you failed, there had to have been some level of vocabulary that you learned. Right? You had to learn the terms. What's the difference between annual and perennial? I was talking to a student in my class. She walked in my office and she says, I'm having a little trouble in your class. I said, what's the matter? She said, you keep talking about plants that flower. I said, yes. She says, I plant flowers. She goes, what's, dif what's the difference between the flowers that I plant and the plants you talk about that flower? I said, the way we we're both defining it. The way we're both using it, the language, the vocabulary we're using. So as gardeners, for you beginners out there, there's this huge body of vocabulary to learn, where we learn concepts, we learn how light influences plant growth, and then we hopefully learn how to apply that to planting plants in our own garden. Does that make sense? So, so, so gardening is a craft, vocabulary. How do we learn vocabulary? We come to, th play, we come to, to events like this so we can enrich ourselves with vocabulary. But that's not where learning a craft stops, okay? Then it's about technique. Did you notice I'm wearing one of, my, one of the important gardening tools? I did that for a reason. I brought a number of tools. I'd hate to, I hate to have somebody turn the lights back on, but um, the, I need to show my tools. Thank you. Okay, so, so understand that, you know, I have, a, I have a neighbor who's a contractor, he, he woodworking, he says the key to a good craft is knowing, having the right tools, right? How many of you have, have taken out a weed with this tool? <laughs> and, and four people raised their hand. There's, there's 25 more I'm going, I'm not going to do that. That's not, okay? Use, knowing which tool to have and then the right tool is very important. And so my pruners go with me everywhere, okay? A pair of pruners without a holster is a lost pair of pruners. Right? Please understand, I have 20 pairs of pruners, but I only have one that I can locate. <laughs> so you know where the others are, okay? I find them from time to time. They're no longer good pruners, but... And so understand that, you know, we can talk to each other about the technique. How do we learn technique? Okay, we take classes, we practice, we fail, all right? But moreover, sometimes we find a master gardener, master gardener, okay? Not necessarily a North Carolina Cooperative Extension master gardener, although we, we love them, and they know a lot, but we find master gardeners and we, we apprentice. My wife's a quilter, okay? First thing she did when she, she's at 24 years old, she said, Bryce, I wanna learn quilting. So she got online. No, she didn't. She was 24 years old. There was no internet. She went to a place called the library and she took out books and then she bought some magazines and she filled her head with vocabulary. I learned the difference between batting and backing. Okay? 
some of you are quilters. You're going, yes, there is a big difference between that. Then when it came time for her to learn technique, tools, she, she apprenticed with my mom. <laughs> That's a different talk. <laughs> that, that was, a, that was a diplomacy on my wife's part. Okay? And then she apprenticed with her, and then she started what? Simple. Table runner. She wanted to do a bed quilt. My mom said, table runner, start simple. There's a message to you gardeners out there, okay? Start simple. Find out which plants will never die. Plant them first. Does that make sense? Start simple. Don't be embarrassed to start simple. There's something very important about this, this arboretum. This arboretum is not about weird, unusual, rare plants. Oh, yes, that's, we, you know, Mark goes out, collects a lot of those kinds of things. But the late J.C. Rawson, it, it was about if the plant can work in a, in a North Carolina garden, then I'm going to promote it. He'd wax and wane about our native dogwood, and tears would come down my eye, okay? Because it's about choosing the right plant for the right place. Technique. Find somebody who's a good gardener, ask them questions, garden with them. Consider being a volunteer at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum if you'd never gardened before. Was that what I was supposed to do? Yeah. Was, it 20 or was it 20 or 25? Oh, okay. Uh, so, so please understand tools. I, I love the bypass pruner. I think that's a great pair of pruners because it, it cuts like a scissor. And you, you make sure you keep a very sharp blade. Um, I'm not um, on commission from Felco, but I highly promote Felco pruners because uh, to me they're the best tool. Why, you know, I, I bought a Black & Decker uh, uh, circular saw, and my neighbor laughed at me. So now I own a Milwaukee. <laughs> you know what's a better tool? It's a better tool because I learned how to use it, okay? So other tools, okay, you've got the pruning saw. Please understand that the pruning saw, buy a good pruning saw. This is, uh, this is uh, Corona, all right? Good pruning saws cut on the pull stroke. That means that if you are on a ladder, don't you ever get on a ladder to prune, but if you are on a ladder to prune, all right, and you're pruning, because it prunes, it cuts on the pull stroke, you won't fall off the ladder. Can you imagine if it cut on the, you see it's center of gravity, and see the little hook here? That's for your hand, so you can pull it, okay? I, I prune more things. I was pruning out in the park behind my house. I was um, 20 feet up in a tree. And I um, was doing this, and a woman walked by, and she said, you're going to fall. <laughs> Soil knife. Soil knife with serration. Orange handle means that it's sold by a company called A.M. Leonard. All their tools are orange handled, so you won't lose them. You won't lose them if you have a holster. See, I'm trying to help you become a garden geek. Look at this. You can fill your whole belt with tools. I usually put this in my back pocket. And then I carry around my long necker cultivator, okay? North Carolina, Greensboro, North Carolina, gentleman uh, invented and makes these, longnecker.com, okay? About $29 for this. Talk about ergonomic. This, you can get tired doing this, right? This, look at, look, I, I dig holes, I weed, okay? I chase rabbits. <laughs> I might have offended somebody just now. <laughs> okay, let's go back. Let's go back. So tools, technique. How do we plant a hole for how do we plant a tree? What size should the hole be? That's all technique. Gardening would, would fall way short if we stopped right there. What's the third part of learning a craft? It's the artistic part. It's the creative part. Okay? To me, creativity is nothing more than your personality manifested in the actions that you're doing. Does that make sense? class of the hundred I'm talking about home landscaping I, I say how many of you feel like you're you're creative out of a hundred how many raise their hand <clears throat> three three right so then I said let me rephrase the question raise your hand if you have a personality <laughs> and you are indeed creative because personality creativity in a craft is nothing more than putting your own personality into into the activity that you're doing all right and we shouldn't apologize for our personality so stop apologizing for your garden. It's yours. It's a reflection of who you are. Be proud of it. Okay? So want to talk about personality? I, I have a retaining wall, so I like to find plants. People walk, some people walk in my garden, they go, oh yeah, you're the guy who likes the weeping things that go over the wall. That's part, that's part of my personality. I, it's something that resonates with me. You know, so I have unraveled boxwood. Laying, oh, oh, by the way, Chris has agreed to send you all a copy, PDF copy of today's presentation. Oh, okay. Okay. So for those of you who are like, ah! Okay, he's agreed to do that for two reasons. One, uh, I, I, I want you to get it. 
I want you to he listen. The second reason I do is because I'll probably, you know, I have a clock, I have time to stop. I probably won't be at the end, and you'll go, what, what was he going to say about that? Well, you, you'll get to see that, okay? So, so yeah, I, I, I like very unique and interesting. Weeping crepe myrtle? Is that not awesome? awesome? This, this was last week. <laughs> yeah, so personality. Okay. So, so check this out. My wife's a quilter, and back when I first started at NC State, I was undergraduate. I got um, uh, promoted to undergraduate coordinator at, um, in 1987, and my wife, being the quilter that she is, designed this quilt for my office. Oh. All right, and so these are all different tree patterns, but she color-wise, everything she created for the fact for a teacher of horticulture. Okay, so these are all trees. I can't tell you what the names of these trees are. They all had names except for that one. That's a tree of temptation. <laughs> Somehow I still remember that. Okay, there's a tree of temptation. Not only that, but I'll, let me go ahead here. You see the, the leaves. Okay, she stole my manual woody landscape plants by Michael Durr because that was the textbook for my plant ID class. And she'd open them up and she traced on tracing paper the different leaves, Japanese maple, red, and then she took them and she incorporated them into the quilt. Do you see how my wife's personality is coming out in this quilt? All right, so let's go back. So this hung on my wall. 18 years later, I'm on the phone talking to a student about a grade, and I, you know, I'll look, I look up at the wall hanging, and I'm looking at the Tree of Temptation, all right, and I'm seeing the apples on the Tree of Temptation, and I notice that they're all vertical, except for this block right here where they're horizontal. Holy moly, my wife made a mistake. Oh. <laughs> I got on the phone, called her, I said, Sue, I've been um, looking at this quilt today, and I noticed that you made a mistake on the Tree of Temptation. You know what she said? She said, I've been waiting 18 years. <laughs> And then you know what she said? <clears throat> she said, Bryce, you have to understand something. In the quilting craft, when mistakes like that happen, we leave them. Okay? We don't take them out and fix them. Because as quilters, we know that the reputation, the quality, the, th this quilt goes up in value because of the error that's in it. Okay? And she said, it reminds us quilters that we'll never get it right. Okay? And so I cherish this quilt. It still sits in my office. Okay? And I still look at the tree of temptation and remember that it's okay to make mistakes. So if you don't remember anything about my talk this morning, remember this. Whatever you do in your garden, it's okay. Okay? And a little mistake that you make, an error, you put pink next to red, whatever you might have done, okay? Please understand that it makes it that much more special and valuable. And so we can relax. We can relax when plants die. Right? You know what that spells? Opportunity. <laughs> At least for me, okay? Gardening's a craft. And you go to the North Carolina um, Arboretum in Asheville, you'll see the quilt garden. Thank you, Wayne. You'll see the quilt garden where in this year's, this year's, or not this year, the year I was there, uh, this pattern was called spinning spools. And, uh, and there's a quilt at home where my wife did spinning spools. And so they, Clara Curtis is a graduate of our program uh, back in um, the, the early 80s in the landscape design program. She coordinates all the horticulture there at the North Carolina Arboretum. When I think about my garden, by the way, I've gardened in the same place, place for 35 years. You know what that means? That means I have great soil. Thank you. Okay, I'm not boasting, I'm just speaking fact. Secondly, I've made all my mistakes in the same place. And I can, I can take you around the garden and show you where I made all those mistakes. In fact, when I think about my garden, I think about it as the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> I can't use this slide in class anymore because the uh, freshman class coming in this year was born in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> and they look at that and they go, well, who's that? <laughs> Gosh, okay, so I, that's what I think about with my garden. And I don't necessarily dress like this as a gardener because there are appropriate clothes that we need to wear. <laughs> I asked my wife, I said, could you come out and take a photograph? I'm getting ready to give a talk. And I said, I, I, I want you to take a photograph of me. And she came out and started laughing. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to look like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> she said, it is not working. <laughs> All right. All right. She said, what's with the toothpick? I said, tobacco products and I don't get along. All right. But, but, but think about it. It's about the good things that happens. It's about the bad things that happen. And there's some really ugly things that we're all embarrassed about. Even those of us who know the science of, of horticulture. Okay. So here I am <laughs> trying to notice I've got a soil knife and a pair of pruners. I am ready to go. Sunscreen, protective headwear. 
I'm ready to garden, and a J.C. Ralston Arboretum t-shirt. I mean, it all works, right? Okay, so let's talk about this word sustainability, all right? We, we could spend hours discussing this, but let me just share with you what I think it means related to gardening. Okay, first of all, I think it has a lot to do with reducing inputs. A lot of people say, what's input? Anything we have to exert or put into something, okay, if we're reducing it, then we're being sustainable. We're trying to, to, to keep that going longer with less. Okay, to me, that's what it is. And so, so uh, fertilizer is an input. Water is an input. Pesticides are inputs, okay? Reducing those, in maintenance is an input. Anything we can do to reduce those things and still be successful on the other end. I think sometimes people think sustainable means it's going to be uglier and it's, the results aren't going to be as good. I don't, I don't agree with that. It's about keeping it up. It's about keeping it up with reduced inputs. It's about mixing it up. We know in horticulture that diversity in a garden makes the garden better. It makes the garden better, it makes people better who are in the garden, and it makes the environment better. Diversity. So the more we can do to mix it up, the more successful our gardens will be. Please understand that I believe, here's the only soapbox editorial statement I'm gonna to make today, right. Please understand that I believe that plants can teach us how to treat one another in society. Diversity gives gardens strength. You do the math. And that's a message we as gardeners need to get out. Monocultures don't work all the time. They require more attention and more care. So anything we could reduce, anything that we could reuse. See the stones in my wall? They all came out of a hole that I dug in order to help reduce the cost of the addition I was putting on my house. First shovel, tink, I went, uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> but it ended up giving me rocks that I could reuse. That's a sustainable approach. I didn't go and buy rocks, buy stone at a store where they were harvested from Tennessee and came here. All right? I used the ones that were in my own backyard. Made it a little bit more difficult, but I did nonetheless. That's reusing. Recycling. We've been recycling. There are lots of things that we can recycle in our own gardens. And if we have products in our garden, Gardens, gardening endeavors that we can't recycle, then there are places where we can take them to be recycled. Gee, I think I'll bring the whole truckload of pots to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. But can we rethink? Can we rethink what we're doing? I want to give you some concrete examples relative to gardening, well, relative to what you might do this afternoon when you leave. But, but this is the approach I'd like to take relative to gardening. You know, plant selection is a sustainable practice. There is a sustainable approach to selecting plants for the, for the landscape. Does that make sense? Okay. Other, other things you read about sustainability in gardening, it'll tell you three things. Soil, water, and plants. Soil, water, and plants. Those are the three things we need to devote our attention to if we're going to try to be more sustainable in gardening. So, and so I'd like this morning to talk with you about three things. I want to talk to you about soil, talk to you about light, and, so, and plant selection. Because I am convinced... I'm convinced, no matter where I go and, and where I speak, I try to communicate that I think plants fail in our gardens because of poor soil, a lack of understanding of how light influences plant growth, and then poor plant selection. Those are the three biggies, I think, as gardeners. If we can improve those three things, I think we could be successful. The other thing is we need to think about end result. What do we want? What's our expectation? And how can we meet that within the context of being sustainable? So let's talk about soil. I'm going to teach you Soil Science 200, a four credit hour course at NC State University in 10 minutes. First of all, soil scientists tell us this is soil, stuff plus space. The message I want to communicate with you this morning is very simply this. The space created by the stuff is just as important as the stuff. Does that make sense? Because plants require water and air to grow. Roots grow where there's water and oxygen. And so the, the space portion of the soil makes sense. So what, ideal soils are well drained and they hold water. Talk about the, both, the end of the spectrum. We want them to drain well, but we want them to hold water. Okay? It's doable, but it's a challenge. It's about building soil. Okay? They promote good root growth and help to hold and provide nutrition. Notice I didn't just say provide nutrition, I said hold nutrition. Okay. So an ideal soil would look something like this, 45% mineral, 5% organic, we'll get to this, for those of you who are going, what does that mean, alright, mineral comes from what, 
Starts with R, ends with Ock. <laughs> Rocks. Okay. Are they alive? No. no. Were they ever living? No. Mm. Okay. So that's mineral. Organic. Organic materials come from and or are living things. Living things. Organic material comes from living things. And then the space created by these two. Okay, 50% would be filled with air at saturation. By the way, we, we in horticulture, we use the word saturation. In a container, we call that container capacity. In a field or garden, we call it garden or field capacity. What that means is after a good hydration, gravity has its way with the water, and whatever's left, that's saturation capacity. Garden capacity, container capacity. At capacity, our soil should not have half water, half air in the space that's the goal, all right? Notice 5% organic matter. Was just at a professional meeting with landscape contractors and the, the expert that was talking about soil building said that should be the goal, 5%. East of the Mississippi River, natural soils generally struggle to get to 5%, especially those soils that are managed by humans. Healthy garden soil, why is healthy in quotes? Because soils are not alive, I'm sorry, it's not Mother Earth. Scientifically speaking, we're talking about a dynamic system that involves both inorganic and dead things and things that are alive, the critters, if you will. All right? So when we use the word healthy, we're implying something's alive. I use the word healthy to say good garden soils do this. Do you know that good garden soils that are built well improve water infiltration by as much as 20%? That means 20% less runoff. Okay, talk to any municipality and you ask them as a homeowner what's the number one thing I can do to contribute to the environment. They will say reduce storm water runoff from your property. Do you realize that just by building soil you are about going about as green as can be. It's probably more important than the Prius that you drive. Oh my god, what did I just say? Do you understand what I'm saying though? We reduce Stormwater runoff by 20% more infiltration. That, that's, that's sustainable. That spells more water for the plants, does it not? So it seems to me the very first thing I would do if I were gardening would be to start building my soil to improve that infiltration rate. Okay? So good soils um, filter and decompose pollutants. Filter and decompose. Good soils do that. They, they, they reduce pollution. By the way, did you know that the number one pollutant in rivers in, the, in North America is sediment? Yeah. Sediment that comes from runoff, okay? Back to the 20%. Guess what, plants live longer in good soil. Is that not our goal? No, Bryce, I really would like to have about a 50% mortality rate so I can go out and buy more plants next year. Okay. Some of us might actually be okay with that. But the idea that plants would have a longer life not only that, but we improve the environment just by building soil. Okay? The wildlife that good soil attracts beyond just the critters in the soil, but the critters around the soil, helps to restore and balance that ecosystem. All right? Not to mention the billions of bacteria that are promoted by good garden soil. Did you know that this good garden soil here has a bacteria in it called Mycobacterium vacai? And scientists have isolated this bacterium and understand that when that bacteria gets ingested by humans or inhaled, that it goes right to the center of our brain that produces serotonin. Yep. Isn't it any wonder that a British study done three years ago in Great Britain identified the fact that gardeners were happier people than people that did not garden? It's physiological. Okay. I think as a kid playing out in the backyard, get my hands dirty. My mom didn't make me wash my hands and I didn't have to wear a helmet. <laughs> before lunch and I'd go inside and I'd eat my lunch and no doubt mycobacterium vacai was flooding my system okay so no wonder I'm so happy okay do you know <laughs> I, I read there's a great book called nature fix by Florence Williams it's all about the benefits of being around plants do you know that 20 minutes in a garden is equal to two Prozac pills Okay. So I was telling a group that I was telling a group that, and one lady raised her hand. She said, "So if I if I took a walk in the garden with Prozac and a glass of wine, then I'm really doing." <laughs> so that's not the point. So scientists uh, identified the bacterium and to prove that it actually does that, what they did was 
they, they took mice, the experimental animal of choice, and they took a, a, a group of mice, they injected half of them with mycobacterium and the other half they did, and then they, did, they, they exposed the mice to the most stressful environment that, that mice have, and it wasn't a cat. It was water. Mice hate to swim. And they threw them all in the pool. And the mice swam across the pool, and they got out, and then they measured all the stress-related physiology in the mouse. Blood pressure, respiration, oxygen content. I have this mental picture of a little blood pressure <laughs> cup. You know. But the mice that were injected, their stress levels were way lower than those who were not injected. So by gardening, you can actually say scientifically, physiologically, if I go out and I work in the soil, and gee whiz, I forgot to wear my gloves today, that you'll be happier at the end of the day. That it does reduce stress beyond good exercise, beyond being outside, all right? I'm trying to help you help others become beginner gardeners. Give them some soap, you know, eat. <laughs> Real men eat dirt. I want that t-shirt. Okay? I love this. How many of us run to our little toddler when they're eating dirt? I, I have six grandchildren. When they start eating dirt, I'm like, knock yourself out. <laughs> I want you to be happy. Right? And speaking of grandchildren, so when they go outside, I have six grandchildren. They're all in the two, two different families, and, the, and they're outdoor kids. The, the, the way that we promote gardening as gardeners is we, we apprentice children. We spend time with children. Okay, there's my message, okay? We want to recruit students in horticulture at the college level, then we need to hang out with five-year-olds. And we need to share the enthusiasm, the passion that we have, and we need to let them do this. I'm thinking of all the mycobacterium that, that's gotten into their systems and why they're so happy. But wait, there's more. Okay? When we have good soil, it reduces the frequency of irrigation needs for the plants. We reduce fertilizer frequency. See how that's sustainable? Building soil creates a sustainable landscape, creates a sustainable garden, because we're reducing inputs. We're spending less money, and we're reducing the inputs that it takes. And we get, like I said, I'm going to say it one more time, our plants live. We don't kill them. Okay. So if we could, would it be nice to go into our gardens and see this, so we would know what kind of soil we have? Just out of curiosity, what color is the best soil? Dirt brown, dirt brown, I like that black. Co please understand, we don't need to make this, we don't need to make this very, very um, confusing, all right? If we look at this, this profile, that's what it's called, the soil profile, and we start at the top, we see that the top layer, okay, is called the O horizon, we give them names. O horizon means that that's where most of the organic material is located, because guess where it comes from? It comes from plants, and it comes from animals. It's the residue, all right? And it begins to decompose at the, at the level of the soil. And so this area of the soil is the O horizon because it's high in organic materials. And then beneath where the organic materials are broken down and contribute, we have what we call topsoil. That's called A horizon. Where do plant roots tend to grow most? In the O and the A horizon. We call that topsoil. All right? That's where roots grow, where there's water and oxygen. And this represents where roots grow. This is called subsoil. That's B horizon. Guess what doesn't grow well in B horizon? Roots. Okay. Roots don't grow well in B horizon. Then C horizon and, and D or R, as they mentioned, it. this is where the minerals come from. This is where the, the, the um, mineral material comes from to create the topsoil. Soil, that's the, the soil horizon. Wouldn't it be nice to know how much of this you have because how much of this is a function of how well plants are going to grow. Henceforth, oh by the way, and this is, those of you just moved, your, your property looked like this before you got there. <laughs> okay, this is the property that's been prepped for sodding. Build a good house on what kind of soil? A, B, O, A, B, C, subsoil. So before a house is built, before a building is built, good civil engineering says take all the topsoil off Build on B horizon because it doesn't shift, it doesn't move, it's compacted, it doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it. Sounds like a great zone for roots, doesn't it? Then the builders come and they build a house and they take tractors. Oh look, there's the, 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 the uh, shingles for the roof, cement mixer. So you take B horizon and then you compact it, right? Then you compact it. What, where, where do roots grow? grow? Where there's water and oxygen. Okay, so now 
This is ready for sodding. So now the sod comes in, and then holes are dug, little bitty holes where trees go in. And we wonder why these plants struggle so. <laughs> we wonder why these plants struggle so. If the new homeowner came in, even to that prepared landscape, and they brought this with them, they would know exactly what they're dealing with. Okay, this is called a soil probe. If you don't have this as a tool, go out and buy this, this tool. amleonard.com. They sell it as well online. I, I would love to see Logan Trading Company go, oh my gosh, we got 20 people ask for soil probes. We don't have one. Okay, drive the garden centers crazy. Ask them for a soil probe. Okay, here's, here's how it works. You take it. You shove it down into the soil. Most of you will go clunk. <laughs> you won't be able. So I have a rubber mallet, and I take mine and down in. Once you get it in as far as you can get in, quarter turn, pull it out. Then you get a profile. There's the top. See the O horizon? Show me on this. Where's the A? Maybe there. Maybe there. Then you're looking at all B. See how B turns that lovely orange? Okay. <laughs> Now, y'all are sitting there looking at me going, you're a gardener, you have a soil probe, can we see your garden? Sure, I'll show you my, my, I'll show you my soil. This is the, the core I pulled out of a landscape bed I've been working for 35 years. All right? Okay, so, scream out when you see B. <laughs> okay? Okay? Now, this is a bed that I, I haven't been gardening in as long. Scream out when you see B. Right there, okay, maybe there, okay, so that's, but I, I've got a good profile for, for plant growth. And all we're doing is looking at the color. The darker the color, the more organic matter that's in there, and the more oxygen that will be in the soil. Then I went out on the cul-de-sac where we haven't been gardening very long. Yeah. See where it stops? But that's about five years worth of effort. Okay, and that's not, did you bring topsoil in? No, we did some things, we'll talk about that as well. Y'all, bed preparation is the key to, to good soil. Bed preparation. Roots grow where there's water and oxygen. You've heard me say that. This photograph is old, Mark. This one year, JC had, had the class, my class out transplanting Japanese maples. And in and, and the first three maples we, we, we transplanted, we did it by USDA standards. We measured the caliper, and then we dug a root ball to match that. Right? Went to take it out of the hole, and two-thirds to three-quarters of the root ball separated from the roots. <laughs> Because the arboretum was nothing more than a big giant slab of clay that we put some mulch on and planted the plants into. Roots grow where there's water and oxygen. All right? And so the, the last tree he, he took us over to, JC said, hey, take some pitchforks and just loosen the soil. Let's see where the roots are. And at the end of that time, we found the root ball. The root ball was an inch and a half to two inches deep and 12 feet wide. Wow. So we, we took it, slung it on someone's shoulder, walked over to another area in the arboretum, and how big was the hole? Two inches deep and 12 feet wide. <laughs> Roots grow where there's water and oxygen. So what can we do? We can cultivate. We can take the soil we have and we can mix it up. We add oxygen just by mixing it up. We cultivate. We can incorporate. Incorporate organic materials into the soil to improve the soil, to literally transform it into to a horizon. Cultivate. Some of you are thinking, okay, Bryce, but I already have lawn. I already have landscape beds with plants in there. If I go in with a cultivator, I'm going to damage those roots. Okay. The third way that we can improve poor soil is to invigorate. How do I do that? You mulch. You mulch. The North Carolina, Department of Hort North Carolina State Department of Horticultural Science Consortium, Substrate Consortium, that's a long name <laughs> for a bunch of guys that are looking at dirt all the time. Okay? But we have a group of scientists that have done research in this area, and what they determined is if you put two inches or less of mulch on top of soil for three to five years, you will literally transform some of the, the B horizon closest to it into A horizon. Humates. Humic acids, that the organic matter is being decomposed by bacteria, leach down into the B horizon and literally transform it. So you have ways you can do this without breaking your back. And then, if you invigorate, maybe you've got an open area, you're going to maybe do a raised bed. Mulching over time builds soil in three to five years. Do you know how, much, how long it takes to build a natural soil? Leave it alone, let the earth do it. 500 to 1,000 years. Okay. If you mulch two inches, three to five years, you'll get, and that, that, my friends, is this. Wow. That was just mulching. We didn't incorporate it. We just mulched. Okay? I know what you're asking. I know what you're thinking. 
What kind of mulch? <laughs> What's the best mulch? Best mulch is that which is most available, affordable, and preferable. Well, come on, tell me. I need to know the best. I'll tell you what I use. Please understand, mulch. That's the most important part. Okay? Building garden soil. Add organic matter, humus, plant. And so how do scientists define organic matter? Plant or animal residue decomposed beyond the point of recognition. If you look at it and you go, I wonder what that was. It's organic matter. Okay? By definition. By soil science definition. Things that come, materials that come from living things are organic. You and I, we're organic. Okay? But we're not organic matter. Yeah. <laughs> Look what organic matter does. Organic matter improves soil physical properties. The physical properties, how much water it holds, how well it drains, how well it, it, the nooks and crannies it makes for root growth. That's physical properties. Okay? And it also improves the soil's ability to be fertile. That means when you add fertilizer, if it's got high organic matter, it has the ability to hold most of it against the forces of leaching. Because rainfall is a good thing, but it also leaches important nutrients that can't be held by soil particles, except or unless we have high matters of clay or lots of organic matter. So if somebody asks me what kind of soil do you want, a clay soil or a sandy soil, I'm always opting for the clay soil. Because between clay and organic matter, my soils are going to have the ability to be more fertile and require less inputs. Make sense? Yes. Great. So manure, what kind, of, what kind of organic matter? Well, composted manure professionally made compost or even Raleigh yard waste or even the compost that you made yourself okay and then mulch if we mulch on the top mulch is just adolescent organic matter it's just pre-organic matter as soon as mulch gets laid down a, a text goes out to all the bacteria saying there's work to be done here <laughs> why is it so hard to get five percent organic matter because organic matter from mulch is always moving in this direction okay organic matter Mulch, born, okay? Adolescent organic matter is transforming into, by soil science definition, organic matter, okay? Then it goes into the stages like middle age, humus. <laughs> those of you who have been middle age, those of you who are, and those of you who aren't but are gonna be, this is the greatest time of life. <laughs> you know why? Because years go by and you, no change. No change. It's good. It's no change, right? And you're stable. And you're able to really excel. It's where careers blossom, right? Same thing, when organic matter gets to be middle-aged humus, it sticks around for a while and it does all its good stuff. But middle-agers who are not middle-aged anymore, I woke up one morning and went, oh crap, I'm not middle-aged, now I'm getting older, right? And from getting older, where, do, where am I headed? Death, gone. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, organic matter goes away. It is the only dynamic portion of the soil. It comes and it goes. That's why it's so hard to keep it at 5%. Okay? We live in a warm, wet place. Guess what promotes bacteria's job to break down organic matter? Warm, wet. Welcome to North Carolina where it's warm and wet. Sometimes dry, but warm and wet. We got bacteria that are breaking down organic matter. We gotta keep adding it to get those 5%. Well, Bryce, what do you use? I use anything that I can get my hands on where I see the word humus, or I see soil conditioner. I don't care what brand it is. Soil conditioner usually is made of small pine bark um, uh, particles, which are really the pre-organic matter, but I know bacteria is going to work it in the way I want. Okay? So I use those. I'm, uh, these are not necessarily products that I use. Okay? Sometimes you can get it delivered. And when it's steaming, it's awesome. Okay? <laughs> Incorporate. Compost yourself. This is the very best high-tech compost pile. It's a pile that you turn, okay? <laughs> Forget all the contraptions and the things you can buy. This works. Okay. And there's compost. Or we can go to supplies. What's so great about Raleigh is we've got a number of landscape supply companies that will actually mix a mix for us. We'll tell them exactly how much compost we want, okay? If you build it, they will come. Who? <laughs> the baseball players. No, if people always say, I need to add things to the soil. No, you don't. You need to build the soil. And if you build it, they will come. The worms will come. The bacteria will come. The mycorrhiza will come. I know I have to go to the store and buy a bag of mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is a fungus. It's a fungus that most plants are in relationship with. And the mycorrhiza fungus help the plant absorb more water and nutrition. And in return, the plant gives the fungus some sugar. It's called a 
It's called a symbiotic relationship, okay? It's a great relationship. I, I guarantee if you buy mycorrhiza and you apply it to a soil that's not been well built, you're wasting your time. You're better off building the soil and they will come. And just like the guy in the movies, when someone said, where did these baseball players come from? He said, I don't know. All I know is if I built it, they would come. So I, where do the worms come from? I don't know. Where does the mycorrhiza come from? I don't know. But if you build it, that would be your time to say they will come. <laughs> I can't even use the Field of Dreams um, movie as an illustration in my classes because they go, I say, how many have seen Field of Dreams? <laughs> and then they want to know who that guy is. Uh, this I get from Home Depot, that I get from Lowe's. Okay, so I'm an equal opportunity box store purchaser. If it says soil conditioner, I'm buying it. Oh, then you can get fancy ones, Humus Plus, organic matter. I, I buy in bags, I have a quarter acre, and I've been used, I've used, I've had stuff delivered. It's all about building soil. Then, incorporating, talking about building soil and about mulch, about 20 years ago, Bartlett Tree did a little bit of research, and they were trying to study absorptive root growth. Absorptive roots. Those are the roots that absorb water and oxygen. Okay? And guess what the study determined? It determined that when tree roots grow under mulch, they, they grow 90% better than if they grow under turf. If tree roots grow under mulch, you'll get 90% more absorbing roots than if they grow under turf. Oh, you should see your faces. <laughs> Let's just stop carving a hole into a lawn and plopping a tree. Let's just stop that. Well, Bryce, that means we're going to have to rethink the way we design landscapes. How cool. I'm going to finish. Anne's going to get up and show you how to design a proper landscape that will maximize this kind of thing. And we haven't even talked. I just know she'll do that. <laughs> She's sweating right now. No. How do I, is that amazing? So there you go. Saw this at a beautiful, beautiful beech tree at, New Zealand, at a botanic garden in Christ Church on New Zealand. And, and they were practicing what Bartlett preaches in that regard. Look at the birthday present I got for my wife. Okay. Other men get shirts. I got 18 cubic yards of mulch. Okay. And she put a big bow on the top and said, it's all yours, I'm not helping. I was fine with that. I was fine with that. Do you know what kind of clothes you should wear when you mulch? <laughs> You're already laughing. <laughs> you know it's not going to be. So I found this man mulching in Washington, D.C., his front yard. <laughs> please, please understand that the tie needs to be tucked in the trousers. <laughs> So that's all I want to say about soil, but I will plug a soil workshop that the Ralston Arboretum offers every February, either the last weekend in January, the last weekend, first weekend in February. It's a half day building garden soil seminar um, that um, we teach right here at the Arboretum. Look for it on the calendar. Um, where's Chris? Over here. Yeah. So I was supposed to do that, right? Oh yeah, I, I teach it. So. Um, <laughs> So when I was a young boy, my dad told me I had to earn half my college education money, and I, told, I, I was very upset. Um, I wasn't even planning on going to college. Um, <laughs> but um, I found myself in my first job at age um, 16 at the, an independent garden center called the Hadley Garden Center. I was a car loader, then I, I, I potted up fruit trees, then I sold fruit trees, then I became a nursery sales, and I learned that I really loved plants and people. So I really thank the Hadley Garden Center for my career because without that, I don't think I'd be standing here with you today. But as a salesperson, one of the first questions we'd always ask when somebody walk in, say, I'm looking for some shrubs for the front of my house. I'd say, well, sir, what direction does your house face? Yes. Number one answer, <laughs> towards the street. <laughs> Please understand that there's a reason why plants fail due to lack of light. Due to lack of light. All right? So please, let's talk a little bit about the importance of light and plant growth. Plants require the following to grow. Water, we know that. Nutrition, we just talked about getting our soils in a position where more nutrition can come. And third, sugar. Plants need sugar to grow. Without sugar, we don't get leaves. We don't get stems. We don't get those beautiful tomatoes without sugar. And sugar is not something that comes from the ground. Sugar comes from the sun. It is a process we all have been taught many times 
and have chosen to forget it, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes water and carbon dioxide and creates sugar out of it, so the plant has two by fours to build leaves, etc. Photosynthesis is driven by this energy source, light. Okay? Without light, you're not going to get good photosynthesis, therefore you're not going to get good sugar production. Is your plant not growing well? Not flowering much? Maybe no flowers at all, or maybe no fruit, or just some small fruit? Why doesn't it look like it looks on the tag? <laughs> How many times do I get that question? I bought this plant, it doesn't look anything like it looks on the tag. So then I say, well, uh, what, have you, what have you done to help it grow? What do we do? What, what do we do when that happens? What's the gardener knee jerk to poor growth? Water and fertilizer. Water and fertilizer. I'm about to rock your world. And I got nine minutes to do it. Where did the time go? <laughs> Here's the deal. There are two, the, the plants are made up of liquid and solid, and the solid portion of the plant represents all the, the, the materials that the plant made to grow. It's called dry weight. We scientists, when we try to figure out which treatment grows the best plant, we suck, we, we dry the plant so all the water's out of the plant, and then we measure and compare the dry weight. Does that make sense? So a plant, a plant has a dry weight. My question to you is, how much of a, the dry weight of a plant comes from the process called photosynthesis versus how much of the dry weight comes from the mineral nutrients that the plant absorbs, percentage-wise? You know what? I, I don't have time to ask you for you to answer, so I'm going to just tell you. 96% of the dry weight of a plant comes from photosynthesis in the form of sugar. 4% comes from nutrition. Do we not have an imbalance in information to gardeners as far as what's important for plant growth? miracle Grow, they're not lying. This plant was grown with miracle Grow. This plant wasn't. So I hear more miracle Grow, more plant. They don't say, by the way, 96% of the dry weight of that plant came from photosynthesis, 4% came from the miracle Grow. Okay. Does this mean it's not important? No, without this, you're not going to get that, and vice versa, and vice versa, and vice versa. <laughs> you can't fertilize a plant into growth if there's not light energy to produce that growth, right? So how did miracle Grow do this? You know what miracle Grow didn't tell you? Okay. They, they, they didn't tell you that all other things that promote growth in this plant were, were provided. Because if you have unlimited light source, you're going to get this if you can, if the limiting factor is the nutrition. In this, in this, in this case here, okay, it had all the light, but it, it didn't have the limiting factor, which was nutrition. With a little bit of nutrition, you can get that. That's why it always looks like we can fertilize a plant into growth. But the plant's got to have the sunlight. It has to have the right sunlight. Is it sunny where you are? Bryce, uh, yes, I have these plants. They're not looking like they look on the tag. And my first question is, what, what kind of plants are they? What does, they, what does it say for light? Oh, it says full sun. Full sun, you say? Yes. Well, uh, that full sun translates into six plus hours of direct, unimpeded sunlight. Silence on the other end. <laughs> then I'll say, do you have that? Silence on the other end. <laughs> then they'll go, uh, y yeah. You lie! <laughs> Gardeners are the most optimistic people I've ever met. <laughs> Gardeners are the most deceptive people I've ever met. We deceive ourselves. I have the plant. I have the plant. I take it over to a location. I read the tag. It says full sun. Yep, that'll do. Okay. That's how we deceive ourselves. We try to convince ourselves it'll work. It says it grows 10 by 10. We have 2 by 2. It'll work. <laughs> That's what we do. We've got to stop doing that if we want our plants to be successful in the places that we put them. Direct, unimpeded sunlight. Anything else is considered partial. Please understand that partial sun and partial shade. After 35 years of gardening, I, couldn't, I can't delineate between partial sun and partial shade. Partial sun's a little bit more sun. Partial shade's a little bit less shade. <laughs> Trial and error with light is a big part of gardening. I have moved plants three to six times to find the right light environment, and I am not going to apologize for it. I'm not embarrassed about it. I have neighbors that come out every spring. They say, let's see what he's going to move this. <laughs> that's, that's part of gardening. It's 
part of that, to me, it, that, it's the doing that's so much that I love. It's not the end result. It's the, it's the challenges that I face. I'm going to finish today by talking, telling you a true story that hopefully will translate into action. Because really, frankly, you'll all be better gardeners and you'll be more sustainable if you select the right plants for the right place and um, you build your soils. Okay? Now, you'll get this PDF and there'll be a whole lot more in there for you to look at. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email. And even more so if you want to get more in depth, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug the Ralston Arboretum's classes. Um, I, teach a cl I teach night classes here at the Arboretum. This fall there's a class we're going to be talking about the best plants for the home landscape. Next spring will be a basic gardening class that will teach all botany basics as it relates to home gardening. You can improve your vocabulary and your technique by, by, by doing that. So I'm, I was nursery sales at the Hadley Garden Center. I'm standing there and a man walks up the aisle. He's very angry and he's pointing his finger at me and he said, I bought some dogwoods from you people. I, I've been well trained. I've been well trained and my, the owner of the garden center told me when they say you people, they're, they're angry about something. And so being well trained, I reached in my pocket and I pulled out, I pulled out a little note card and I, I said, yes, sir, tell me, tell me what's wrong, because that validates their concern when you pull out a note card. Yes. And he said, I bought these dogwoods three years from you. I planted them according to the way you told me to plant them. He said, they've been in my landscape for three years, and I haven't seen a flower. What are you going to do about that? He was going on and on about that. So I started asking questions. So where are they located? How often have you fertilized? You know, that, those kinds of things. And this sweet little old lady was walking behind. She might have been old, but she had good ears. And she, she looked up, she paused, she said, excuse me. She said... I had the same problem with my dogwoods. Well, that got his attention. The first question he asked her was, did you buy them here? <laughs> I think he was a lawyer. <laughs> and, and she said, oh, yes. And then he looked at me. And I, I, I'm a teenager going, nah. right? And so finally he looked at her and said, what did you do? And she said, well, they didn't flower, and they didn't flower, and they didn't flower. She said, then? I beat him with a stick. <laughs> Both of us were like, what? Now he pulls a piece of paper out of his pocket. With a pen, he's like, what kind of stick? Was it bamboo? Was it metal? What time of year? How many wax per trunk? That woman would go out with a bamboo rod and whack the trunk of the dogwood. <laughs> and get it to flower. Now he says to me, do you have any bamboo stick? <laughs> I've lost control. Plants have the ability, listen, plants have the ability to partition sugar. You know, sugar from photosynthesis. They have the ability to decide, if you will, where it should go. Okay? And the two choices are vegetative growth, roots, stems, and leaves, or, and or, reproductive growth, flowers, fruits, and seeds. If a plant doesn't have enough to do both, what's the default? Vegetative. vegetative growth. If the plant doesn't have enough, it's going to default to vegetative growth. If it has enough, it'll do both. Okay. Unless that plant is stressed. It's a biological organism where, within the context of its survival, if it's facing imminent death, it will repartition sugars to reproduce. That's why azaleas that are fl spring flowering flower in the fall after real bad drought. That's why plants do weird things at weird times, especially with their flowers, because they've been stressed. Plants don't think, but if they did, they'd be going, oh crap, I'm going to die, I need to have some kids. <laughs> so this woman was beating the snot out of her, her, her trees. So I asked the question, I got lucky. I looked at the woman and I said, ma'am, how are your trees doing today? Oh, they died. <laughs> they died. She caused those plants to repartition sugar such that every year the leaf, leaf mass, leaf volume got smaller and smaller and smaller until the plant could not even survive. And so we got back to talking this gentleman and I. It turns out he planted them in a grove of pine trees, heavy shade. When he went in, hired a company to come out and thin those trees and two years later those dogwoods were in full flower. There she is. <laughs> That's why so many people grow jade plants and never are concerned that they don't flower. Because that's not the expectation. Jade plants require a high, high, high light energy, lots of light energy for them to flower on a regular basis. That's why we often see jade plants in botanical gardens flowering, because they're in greenhouses. 
But I have a jade plant. I've had a jade plant for 25 years. It's never flowered. And I've never gone, why hasn't it flowered? Okay. I'm okay with it not. It's about expectations. But please understand that light has a unique and interesting effect on plants. And the last thing I'll leave you with, beginner gardeners, if you're using plants in the landscape that are multicolored or a different color, please understand they, re they generally re will require a higher light intensity and duration than the very same species that's green. This is a yellow saguaro false cypress right here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Okay? It is genetically coded to have low levels of chlorophyll, high levels of the yellow pigment, okay? the, the, the xanthophylls. Okay? And as a result, this is what it looks like in full sun. Move it into a shadier location, Look what happens. That's not the, the yellow going away. That's just the plant producing more chlorophyll to be able to gather up more light energy from a lower light environment. But if you take this plant, plant it full shade, what will it do? It will die. Unless you beat it with a stick. So go out and garden. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Learn as much science as you can. And then don't be afraid to make mistakes. Thanks very much for your attention.